A large part of the progress of astronomy over the last 70 years has come from opening up the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Back in 1940, we basically only did astronomy at optical wavelengths. Since then, we've explored radio, X-ray, gamma ray, infrared, ultraviolet, and this has revolutionized astronomy. But now we're kind of stuck. We do the entire electromagnetic spectrum. In principle, there are ultra-hard gamma rays and ultra-long frequency radio, low frequency radio waves that are still to be observed, but they don't get anywhere near the Earth. So that's never going to tell us very much unless we can get observatories outside of our galaxy. So what can we do? Well, one possibility is to use an entirely new spectrum, the spectrum of gravity waves. To talk us through that, it's a great privilege to have uh, David McClelland, who's director of the ANU Centre for Gravitational Physics with us, who is leading our effort to find gravity waves. Thank you very much, Paul. So, David, what's a gravity wave? Well, Paul, as you know, Einstein's general relativity explains gravity as arising from mass curving space-time. So, if mass curves space-time, if space-time can be curved, it means it's flexible. Now, anything that's flexible can support waves, and waves in space-time curvature are gravitational waves. So, what does a gravitational wave look like when it hits you? Well, it's, uh, it's quadrupole in nature, so as it passes through objects, it it causes them to distort in a, just like distorting a circle, you get squashed in one direction while squeezed in the other, then the sign changes and you get squeezed and squashed in one direction and stretched in the other. So it's a squashing and a squeezing, stretching and squeezing as a gravitational wave passes through. So the passing through us all the time, we're being stretched and squeezed by gravitational waves as we speak. So what would actually create a gravitational wave? Well, they arise from, the, from any motion which is not spherically symmetric. Any matter moving in a non-spherically symmetric manner can generate gravitational waves. Two objects which are circling around each other will generate gravitational waves. The problem, of course, is that uh, these eff effects are extremely small. Yes, I'm, I'm not noticing you elongating and squashing as you sit here, so why not? Why aren't the gravity waves doing that to you? Well, space-time is flexible, but it's extremely, extremely stiff. That means it needs very violent events to generate even the smallest amplitude of a wave. So, for example, the, uh, if we have two neutron stars a few megaparsecs away orbiting each other, as they're going to crash in, they're going to change, they're going to generate a gravitational wave whose strain, which is the way we measure gravity waves, it's the length change divided by the length. Remember, something stretches out, so we want to measure how much that length changes as a fraction of the separation. So for a pair of neutron stars which are colliding, that change is one part in 10 to the 24. That's as measured at the Earth. Presumably it'd be much bigger if you're actually close to the neutron stars. It's, uh, it's much bigger, but it's still a very small effect. So it, in our region, the Earth, it's about that um, 10 to the minus 24 is the strain. So that means, let's say, humans about a metre in length. Um, oh maybe two metres in length if you're a basketball player. Mm -hmm. um, so two metres times 10 to the minus 24, so two by 10 to the minus 24, given that the, the nucleus of an atom is 10 to the minus 15 of a metre, we're talking about a billion times less than the nucleus of an atom. Yes, it's an extremely small effect. So the, the more massive the objects which collide, the larger the amplitude. So the typical sorts of amplitudes we may be looking for on Earth over the next few years are more like 10 to the minus 18 to 10 to the minus 19 of a metre. Well, that's so it's more like 10,000 times the smaller than the size of a nucleus. It's a, an almost unimaginably small effect. In fact, if I stop and think about it too long, I think this seems pretty ludicrous. However, we're only a factor of 10 away from doing that. Now this seems completely impossible. You're trying to look for changes in length of your one ten thousandth the, the nucleus of an atom. I mean, how can we possibly hope to do something like that? Well, Paul, one of the methods we use is, is called interferometry. We, we're going to use Michelson interferometry. So a Michelson interferometer is a, it's a laser beam which shines onto a mirror which splits the laser beam into two. Mm -hmm. One laser goes off at one direction, the other one at a perpendicular direction for four kilometers, where it's reflected off a mirror, comes back to the beam splitter where we look for the interference, the change in the pattern of one wave combined, when it's combined with the other wave. And that interference will tell us about anything which has caused changes along those two perpendicular arms. Presumably so it's relative changes. Relative changes. So remember the gravitational wave causes a stretching and a squashing. 
So one arm stretches, the other squashes. So if I have a laser interferometer, this length, this laser beam is, getting, is measuring a shorter distance, this one is measuring a longer distance, and we can measure that by the interference pattern. Now, we haven't got a four kilometre long experiment here. Where are these things actually located? Well, the, there are a number of them, about uh, three of these long interferometers around the world, two in the United States, which is called the LIGO project. And LIGO is Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory. And there's one in Europe, in, in Pisa, that's a French, Italian, Dutch project, and it's called Virgo. So what we're doing here is developing technology for LIGO, is that right? Yes, we are. These. Uh, instruments, it sounds quite a simple idea. You just measure this change compared to that change, this arm changing compared to that one. But there are so many things that cause those differences in lengths to happen. There's the Earth's seismic noise. If you just put one mirror on the ground here and another one there, the Earth is vibrating. So that seismic vibration, which is one micron in size, that's 10 to the 12 times bigger than the effect we're trying to measure. Then there is quantum noise we have to worry about. Then thermal noise, the mirrors are hot. So they're fluctuating with, K, with energy. The atoms jiggling around. A atoms are jiggling around and that jiggling around in this arm is different to that arm. So this jiggling around causes a different effect on the laser beam to that jiggling around. So somehow we have to make our instrument insensitive to that. There is thing, just gas particles passing through the laser beam changes the refractive index, which also is going to create a problem for us. So we need to put our systems in gigantic vacuum tubes. Four kilometer long in one direction, four kilometer the other, one meter diameter vacuum at the largest ultra high vacuum systems ever made. Oh, is this um, LIGO currently capable of detecting enough, small enough strain to be able to pick up gravity waves? Well, LIGO, we ran the first generation of LIGO up until about 2010, 2011, where it reached about a factor of 10 to the limits we wanted. So we needed to, and we'd been planning over that year, we, it was already, already known when LIGO was designed that it wouldn't be sensitive enough. But the US National Science Foundation funded it to prove the principle and then funded the next stage to get that next factor of 10. And laboratories like this one in particular, we're working on the techniques and the technologies to take us that extra factor of 10 down in sensitivity so we can finally see gravitational waves. So what sources of noise are you having to overcome to get that extra factor of 10? Well, one of those sources of noise is called thermal noise. The fact that the mirrors are fluctuating with the Brownian motion, which is going to mask the signal unless we do something about that. And one of those things we need to do is to measure that effect and see if we can use ultra-pure materials to make it smaller. So one of the big sources of noise we're going to have to overcome to get this extra factor of 10 in sensitivity is the thermal noise, the random vibrations of the atoms and the mirrors. And this is what this experiment here is addressing. So would like to explain what's going on here? Yes, this uh, experiment is uh, to understand the, the noise or the thermal noise properties of the materials which we're going to be using in not just the advanced LIGO, but the next generation beyond that. We're already planning for LIGO Voyager. And LIGO Voyager is going to have a range out to a redshift one. So it's, a, it's going to see a lot of sources, but we need to understand the thermal noise of the materials we use in that device. One of the materials is called silicon. Now silicon is extremely well known, of course. It's a, in, in all, a, a big industry, but we want to build mirrors out of silicon that are this size and we want to cool them down to 120 Kelvin and we want to understand how the thermal noise of the mirror varies as we change the temperature. So we have to set up an experiment which is almost like a mini interferometer. So we take what we've got here is a vacuum chamber. So inside this vacuum chamber the, we've got an ultra high vacuum level. All of the gas has been pumped out. Coming down the side here is a, an isolator. It's a series of pendulums at the bottom of which we're filtering out seismic noise. Now this is an interesting little experiment one can do. You can take a, a pendulum, if I have one here, it'd be an easy experiment. If you move the top of a pendulum very fast, you know, simple mechanics tells us that if you move it above the resonance frequency of the pendulum, the pendulum doesn't move much at all. So we filter out seismic noise by using that filtering effect of a pendulum. 
So then at the bottom of that we have an optical table, a bench which has an optical cavity in it. Now an optical cavity has one mirror made of silicon and an, a front mirror and the light bounces between the silicon mirror and the interrogating mirror. And we're using the light to measure the properties of the silicon. And our, so we take the, we have a, we start off with our laser, which is a, it's called a 1064 nanometer laser here. This, the, all these optics condition the laser so that it's got the right shape to be shone in down through a periscope into this port here, into the vacuum system where the little cavity is with a silicon mirror on it, the silicon flexure. The light is then reflects off that cavity, comes back in through this path, through this isolator onto a photo detector here and we use the information received on that photo detector to measure the displacements or the noise which is fluctuating in that system. And then we're comparing that noise to the properties of the predictions from the what's called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Just how big the thermal noise is, what should it be, does it fit theory. If that works then we know that silicon is going to be a good material to use in future detectors. So this is a, a, a that's the main property we're after in this particular experiment. Okay.